Hey guys, it's Shade from Sadie Saves a Day, and today I wanted to talk to you about the Zorn palette. This is going to be two videos, and this first one is going to talk about gouache. So I've been using the Zorn palette to make the portraits in my Black History Month series, and that really helped me with a lot of the different problems that I had when I was working on skin tones. And I definitely wanted to keep a space for that in my palette, but I wanted to arrange my palette into three different sections with the primary and secondary colors, which was a great suggestion by one of the viewers, but I didn't know what I was going to do with my Zorn palette. So I actually remembered that I have the smaller Magello palette that I haven't been using since I got the bigger one that I showed you in a video that I'll leave a link to. And what I decided to do was basically just clean out that palette and fill it with just the Zorn colors. I took out the colors from the old palette and I put it in these wells that I got from Gristecker. Actually, these are a really cool way to have a gouache palette with a lid that keeps them pretty moist. And I'll probably be doing a review on that in the future. I did some mixing experiments and I put them in there. I'll talk about that later. So you might be wondering why I keep talking about Zorn. So Zorn is a Swedish painter who lived during the late 19th and early 20th centuries called Anders Zorn. He was very famous for his landscapes, but particularly his portraits. He used mostly a limited palette, which is said to have been white, ochre, or any kind of yellow earth, vermilion, and ivory black, plus occasionally an accent color like a cerulean blue or a bright green or something like that. This palette is really, really useful for getting the hang of doing portrait studies because it does most of the colors that you could need in that range. And it does it without you having to worry about mixing a ton of different colors together. You only have four colors. That's it. So that's why they call it the Zorn palette. Now that we have that out of the way, so the colors that I chose to use with my Zorn palette are yellow ochre, and I basically just mixed together the two warm reds that come in the Windsor Newton Designer's Gouache set, and I used the black that came with it, and titanium white. As normal, I had to mix some glycerin into the Windsor Newton Gouache, but that's basically the end of the Windsor Newton gouache for me. So now when I'm refilling, I'm probably going to end up using some Schmincke gouache. Actually, I got some Schmincke Academy gouache and that is kind of smelly, guys. And I got glycerin everywhere, but that's not that difficult to clean up. Just kind of sticky and lame. So I smoothed them out with a toothpick. Some colors needed more glycerin than others. And it's kind of nice just having a really small palette with a couple of colors. Okay, so now what I'm doing is a set of color scales for the Zorn palette. This is kind of technical, it took a while <laughs> because there's a lot of kind of precise mixing that's going on. But basically what I did is for each of the colors, I took a little bit of each of the things and I put them in five different spots and then they have to be mixed with white. So I mix a certain amount of white into each of them using a palette knife. Eventually I'll also mix them with black, but right now I'm just mixing them with white. So if you look at the chart, you'll see there's a bunch of words and percentages. So the first column is yellow ochre pure, and there's 100% yellow ochre, then 80% uh, with the white in it, 60%, 20%, 5%. And it goes down like that until it gets lighter and lighter. And then as you move to the right, you see YR to the 1. And then on the bottom, it's supposed to be the yellow ochre with a trace of black. So 100% black, 80% black, 60% black, 5% black. In the end, when you finish all of these things, you should have almost all the different combinations and ratios that you can make with these colors. So then as we move to the right, you start adding a little bit of red into the color. So... You see it says YR2 to 1, and that means two parts yellow to one part red. 
in the yellow ochre that's 100% and then it goes down like that. It's a little confusing. I will be totally honest, I think I messed up a couple of times and the yellow ochre was not the best progression, but I think it got easier over time. So even though we don't particularly have a brown color in this limited palette, you can see that by mixing the yellow ochre and the red and the black, you get a pretty good range of warmer and cooler browns. And you also get a decent range of pinks and peaches. You even have some greenisher yellows which you get when you're just mixing the yellow ochre with the black. The black in this limited palette basically acts as your darkener and your cooler. It's your blue color equivalent. So it's a good idea to choose a blue leaning black. A warm leaning black is not really going to work for you in this palette. So as I move further to the right, we get warmer and warmer skin tones, getting into the sort of burnt sienna a uh, sort of range, really ruddy, tanned skin. I put the masking tape on because I wanted it to be pretty clean when I took everything off because this is just a gazillion different little squares and it would be too confusing for me to look at if I didn't clean up the edges. So I felt really bad because there was a ton of gouache actually and I didn't want to waste it so I mixed up these colors and I just wanted you to see it. Actually look at that color. Isn't that like really nice complex deep color? So next I'm going to be mixing up the red. So just like before you start with five different piles and now I'm trying to use a toothpick to more scientifically partitioned out the white. I don't know how well that worked, but I tried. And also put it in order that makes sense. Sometimes you need to add a lot more white, like I did to that last pile to make it significantly whiter than the second to last pile. again you're starting with pure red and then as we move down I'm going to be adding white to it and on the bottom so oh, this is a mistake that I made I had to completely paint over the bottom because this was not supposed to be a trace of black I had just copied the text from the first yellow ochre one and then I realized that doesn't really make sense because I need to mix the red with the black going to the right and so I fixed that <laughs> and it's supposed to be a trace of yellow and a trace of red. So I put out a little bit of yellow for each of the things and I just painted over that with the gouache. Thankfully, with gouache, you can just paint over stuff once it's dry. So that wasn't that big of a deal. If it was watercolor, that would have been really, really annoying. But it was gouache, so that wasn't a big deal. And I just redid that. That's the trace of yellow for the red. So starting out, obviously, we're getting a lot of really inky colors. And then as we move to the right, we're going to be adding more black to each of them. So it's going to get darker and it's going to get cooler because it's a cool black. In this row, you get a lot more pinky colors, so for lighter skin tones, for highlights, and you get a lot of salmons. Uh, actually, I feel like this palette wouldn't be the worst for doing floral paintings. Obviously, it's not going to give you completely accurate colors because it doesn't get that saturated, but you can actually make a pretty good range of colors with it.
So I wouldn't have imagined that the red column would get quite so dark. But you actually end up getting these vaguely purplish colors when you mix the red, black, and yellow. Once again, I'm just mixing all of this up because the color is really nice and I didn't want to just get rid of it. Now, last color, the black. And putting out that white, I'm really glad I have a huge tube of white. This is the Academy Gouache. Like I said, this is a 60 milliliter tube. I'm not really worried about using too much of it. Like before, I had to add a little bit more white because sometimes just to make a step, it's not a one-to-one -one ratio. You need to do it a little bit more. I'm using a palette knife just because it makes the cleanup from mixing these colors a little bit easier and using a brush and saves on the wear and tear. And like before, I'm adding the little bit of the color that I have to tint with just there on the rim of the plate so that I have it right there. And I have the little bit of the red that I need to work with on the rim of the plate as well. So for the last column, So the black mixture ends up getting mixed with a tint of red in order to bring it full circle. And just like with most of the colors, this ends up with a sort of grayish, warmest grayish brown. But right now it's just really grays, full grays and warm grays. So even though you have a cool black, you're still able to make warm grays. And as we move to the right, we're adding a little bit of yellow. Our so black is a lot more powerful than the yellow, so these are going to stay pretty dark. But you really do get some really interesting grays when you get into the middle portion of the chart here. It might not look too interesting on the chart, but that's really where you're going to get a lot of your variation. The differences between these colors is a lot more subtle than if you were using the regular primary colors or something like that. And that's how you're able to get a much more realistic look really easily, because you don't have to desaturate these colors. They're already extremely desaturated from the beginning. And then I got this, this kind of pretty gray, like a designer gray, <laughs> kind of purplish. I covered my sketchbook with it. So now just going to take off all the masking tape. I'm gonna tell you ahead of time, you should wait longer than I did to take off the masking tape. I knew this was gonna be a bad idea, but I just really wanted to get going and I wanted to see what the squares looked like. So at first it started okay, as I was starting from the more dry side, but then the paper started ripping a lot, but it still ended up not so bad.
Even just looking at it with the tears and all, it's pretty amazing the range of colors that you can get from these. Ah uh, yes, there you see where I am starting to have some extreme problems because that's the last part that I painted. But I just kept going. I'm not going to stop. Why would I stop? So we go from really warm on the left-hand side to really cool on the right-hand side and finally starting to warm up again on the extreme right-hand side. You got yellow ochres, burnt, raw umbers, all those colors, everything in there. So these are some portraits that I made using this palette. That's Toni Morrison. That's Alexander Parks. So this is a portrait of Marielle Franco. She's an Afro-Brazilian activist who was killed just recently. And I've been wanting to do a portrait of her. So that is what I'm doing here. On the left-hand side, you're seeing a painting of Mai Ayim, who you're going to see the process of this painting in the next video but I did them both on the same page and simultaneously, so that's why you're kind of going to see some of the progress at the same time. So actually doing this portrait was kind of difficult for me because I hadn't realized that there's one thing that I found really important that I had forgotten to do for my use of this palette. For darker skin tones, I use the zinc white, not the titanium white. The titanium white, I found, is way, way too cool, and it ends up making people look ashy. And I just uh, couldn't understand why I wasn't getting the saturated warm tones that I wanted, and it was because I had to mix everything with the titanium white, and that just really wasn't working well with this darker skin tones. Once I finally remembered and added zinc white back into the palette, everything started working the way that it was supposed to work. So personally, I would recommend also having zinc white there because it doesn't cool down your color as much. And that's really helpful in maintaining some of the life in darker skin tones. So this isn't a super refined or detailed piece. But I just wanted to show a little bit of what you can do with this palette. I put in the darks first, which is useful because they can help you just have a way to ground yourself. And then I started putting in the tones around that, a lot of kind of yellowish, yellow ochre type of tones. If you have trouble with painting portraits in gouache, this is definitely a palette that I would recommend using. I've heard a lot of people say that their colors end up looking very strange and non-realistic, and I feel like it's almost impossible to fail with this palette. It really simplifies the way that you have to think. If you want something to be warmer, you add red to it. If you want something to be cooler, you add black to it. If you want it to be darker, you add black to it. If you want it to be yellower, you add yellow to it. It's really simple. If you want it to be brighter, you add white to it. There's not a ton of different decisions that you can make. It really limits what you can do, but it doesn't feel restricting because especially for portraits, it can end up being pretty realistic. If you want to add really dark colors, you could also add burnt umber into this palette. If you don't want to continually mix with black and you feel like the black is cooling down your darker colors too much. But it actually works pretty well for a wide range of skin tones from light to dark.
hope that this was helpful in just explaining about this palette and showing how you can use it in gouache. It's most traditionally used in oil, but obviously since gouache is also an opaque medium, it translates pretty easily. In the next video, like I said, I'm going to talk about using it in watercolors and that becomes a little more tricky, but it's also still super useful. I hope this is fun and informative. Thank you so much to my Patreons. You really help me be able to make these videos and put them out every week. And soon I'm going to be releasing some new stuff exclusively for my Patreon, some tutorials. So you might want to be on over there when that happens. Thank you guys for watching. Talk to you next time. Bye.